Morning. Okay, we are still in the book of 2 Kings. We are still in our Kings series. Uh, and today we're going to jump into 13, here, chapter 13. Now, there's been a progression, you've, if you've been following along, you've noticed from the very first of 1 Kings till now. Uh, and that is Israel has slowly been degrading as a spiritual nation. It's slowly just changing. And, and, and as we start to get farther into the chapter and the later chapters of 2 Kings, it's, it seems to be changing much quicker. So pretty much since we first started reading and studying through this, we saw Israel as one nation. We saw it divided into two nations, the kingdom of Judah and the kingdom uh, of Israel. We saw it split into two nations. And we saw that Judah, I mean, had its ups and downs, obviously. And there was a few good kings and a few not so good kings. But Israel, really all their kings are pretty much stunk. I mean, they really haven't had any good kings. They've had terrible leadership the entire time, and it just keeps getting worse. And because of the terrible leadership, they start to drift away from God, and then they start rejecting God. Then they start getting involved in pagan worship, and then God has to discipline them. And when he disciplines them, they usually get captured by another nation or overtaken by another nation. And then what ends up happening is they get taken away to a foreign land, and they start to kind of adapt the cultures of the lands that defeated them. Well, then they take it a step farther, and you notice as you go back and study through their history, they started intermarrying with a lot of the pagan cultures, which God flat told them not to do. He said, do not do that, because they will get in your hearts and change your hearts. But they continued to do that, and they intermarried with the other pagan, you know, the countries that had defeated them and brought them into captivity. And as, as that happened time and time again, each time they lost a little bit more of their original identity. Right? And they started assimilating a lot of other cultures into their culture. And by the time we get to the, where we're studying at right now, Israel is just about unrecognizable from when it first started. I mean, most nations probably think of it as a pagan, as a pagan kingdom. I mean, it's just the way it is. But something that's kind of interesting is how many people have noticed in the New Testament how bad the Jews hate the Samaritans? You guys, you guys notice that? We're starting to see a tie-in here because the Israel of 2 Kings and Judah are two totally different groups, right? Well, because of the intermarrying and because of the bringing in other cultures and stuff, Israel starts following that path and never really gets off of it. Israel worships in Samaria and uh, Judah worships in Jerusalem where they're supposed to worship. Well, if you follow this all the way to the New Testament, Israel of 2 Kings becomes the Samaritans of the New Testament. And in the New Testament, the Jews or the, the Hebrews and Jews that are in Jerusalem, they're the ones that come out of Judah. But they look at the people who came down from the descendants of Israel, and they see them as half-breeds. That's why they hated them, because they were half-Jewish and half-something else, right? Because they mixed in so many different cultures, they weren't, you know, they weren't all Jews anymore. And they, and they saw them as half-breeds, and they could not stand them. And that went deeper than just the fact that you know, they were half-breeds. It went all the way back to that was the dividing of those two nations. And it's still going on into the New Testament. So they, they never really get their footing back because they you know, just had so many, so many bad leaders all the way up. But today we're going to discuss some, just a few of the newer kings. I'm going to give that very little time, because I don't know about you guys, but I am tired of hearing so-and-so was the king and was terrible, then another one comes up and was the king and was terrible, then he died, and another one. And I was reading through the first 13 uh, verses of the chapter, and I thought, yeah, I'm just not going to read that. And here's why. Let me give you a summary of what it says. They had a king, and they stunk. And they died. And they got another king, and he also stunk. And he died. And they had another king. And that's all it is. I mean, literally for 13 verses, they're talking about how terrible Israel's kings are. So we're not going to talk a lot about that. The title of today's message is The Power of Preparation. And preparing is so important. You know, as a coach, I, I tell girls all the time that the games are won on the practice field. They're won and lost on the practice field. And, and it's true. How you practice determines how you play. Right? It's really, really important. And today, Elisha is trying to teach the king of Israel this. And out of his last days on earth, he's trying to get him to understand that God has a plan he wants to prepare you for if you'll listen. But, I mean, after all, the king he's talking to is from Israel. Okay, so we're going to jump in. I'm not going to read verses uh, 1 through 13. Uh, I'll actually not read 1 through 9 or 12 and 13. I'll actually read 10 and 11. You're welcome. But the reason being is it's this king was up, he died, and was terrible. That's what it is. Okay, one after another, they were just awful. The one thing I do notice is that if you ever noticed when you're reading through these chapters, do you feel like nobody ever learns anything? I mean, they never learned anything from the previous administration. They, they don't learn anything. You know, have you ever had that friend or family member that just never learns? If, if you, are you the family member? You can, 
But you know what I mean? They get in trouble, and they go, they, they deal with the consequences of trouble. They get out, and you're like, new start, and it's right back. Or, you know, they, they do well. They lose their job. They're not doing well. You, know, it's just, and you start thinking to yourself, eventually you want to go, oh, my gosh, have you learned anything? You know, look back at your life. You're doing the same thing. So you're going to end up the same way. It's the same thing here. I see them, and I keep thinking, gosh, they're never going to learn? You would think that when the king before you was decimated for rejecting God, you'd go, hmm, maybe I won't reject God. You know, that's not the case. I mean, just one after another after another. I think they actually got used to just letting sin reign in their lives and in Israel. I think they got used to it. It became accustomed to them. They just were used to having sin in their life and in Israel. And even though they knew that it had destroyed their predecessors, it, it just didn't change their mind. They still followed suit. And you would think one thing would sink into them. See, one, there's been one constant truth since the creation of time, and that is sin destroys people. It always has. It always will. That has never changed. It always destroys people. But the reason we keep getting tied back into it is that, like these kings, we get accustomed to it. We kind of get accustomed to having, you know, oh, that's my sin. You know, or, I, yeah, I struggle in that area. We get accustomed to that sin, and, and it's hard to let go of it, isn't it? Sometimes it's really hard to let. I mean, I don't sin. I know you guys do, but no, I'm just kidding. I sin as much as anybody. So, right? So, and the funny thing is, is the enemy convinces you that your sin is different. He just convinces you of that. And I am certain that's what he was doing with these kings. Because he convinces you, yeah, yeah, sin is bad, yeah, and it does destroy people's lives. But not really your sin. Because your sin is different. Your sin is harmless. You don't hurt anybody. You're not killing anybody. You're not stealing someone's retirement. I mean, how bad is your sin? You know what I mean? He, he just helps you justify it. But here's the thing is there's no such thing as a harmless sin. Here's the deal. When you refuse to obey God's commands, it's sin, right? If you look at 1 John chapter 3, starting in verse 4, it says, Everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. I mean, here's the thing. It doesn't say what kind of sin is lawlessness. All sin is lawlessness. And the Bible tells us all the time that there are consequences to sin. And we get so used to hearing these passages. I'm about to read these passages to you. And you've probably heard them so much, you're, you're probably numb to them. You're going to hear them and go, yeah, I know what he's talking about. And probably not even process the rest of what I'm saying because you've gotten so used to it. Right? Galatians 6, 7, do not be deceived. God is, mock, is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, what? This he will also reap. How many times have we quoted that together? You know, Verse 8, for... The one who sows to his flesh, meaning the things of this world, the things that please you personally, uh, it says, for the one who sows to his flesh will from his flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. How about this in Romans 6, 23, just the first part. For the wages of sin is death. death. You guys all know that scripture, don't you? Have you heard it before? Amen. Does it impact you still when you hear it? Because I think we get so used to it that it stops impacting us a little bit. We're just used to that. Yeah, 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 sin causes death. Right? And here's the thing. Sin is an equal opportunity destroyer. Okay? It doesn't care what race or gender or ethnicity you are. It doesn't care if you're old. It doesn't care if you're young. It doesn't care if you're a king. It doesn't care if you're a slave, whether you're rich or poor. You let sin hang around in your life, and it will destroy you. It's just the way it is. And each king mentioned in the first 13 verses fell victim to the curse of sin. It destroyed every one of them, and yet they never learned. So although I'm not going to read those verses, that's the takeaway, is sin destroys lives, and evidently, they weren't learning from it, okay? That's kind of where it's at. But there's this thing, there's an old saying I'm sure all of you have heard, it's if you don't learn from your history, you're doomed to repeat it. You guys ever hear that saying? It is very, very true, and we see that throughout the generations in Israel. But I think it's only fair before we judge them too harshly that we honestly stop for a second and say, is it changed? Has anything changed? Are we just like them? And I, and I think the honest answer is, I think we are. Because, you know, whether it's a believer or an unbeliever, if you continue to reject God, it's going to start destroying your life. And I think we've gotten so used to it. I mean, like the kings of Israel, we just justify our sin and move on. And we hear these passages and they bounce off of us. Right, And, and it, it really worries me that we've gotten to that point because the more you justify your sin, the more you dismiss your sin, the easier it is to keep doing it. And listen, I'm as guilty as anybody. I'm not going to be that guy that stands up here and goes, be like me. I'm going to say, uh-uh, don't be like me. Keep your hair. But 
Think about it for a second. We all, you don't have to admit it unless you really want to, and I will give you a mic. But we all have that sin in our life we just struggle with. You know what I mean? You fight with. The one you're saying, God, help me. What is, what is wrong with me? The Apostle Paul had that sin. The Apostle Paul was like, Lord, please remove this from me. We all have that sin in our life. And if you notice that you, after a while from dismissing it and excusing it and saying I'm not as bad as others, you notice that it, it just gets comfortable to do it. And we let it rest in our lives until it destroys us. And I think every time we choose to sin and every time we accept the excuse, we are trivializing sin and we're trivializing the effects of sin. But here's the truth. In the end, it leads to destruction. And I don't understand why Israel didn't learn from it. I don't understand why we don't learn from it. Because here's the thing. The definition of insanity is to do the same thing over and over and expect a different result. Listen, if there's something in your life that's hindering you and God has been working on you with it and disciplining you with it, if you want it to go away, something has to change. You have to stop being comfortable with it. I just don't think Israel ever got comfortable with it or got, ever you know, got sick of being comfortable with it. I mean, the only way to break that cycle was one of those kings had to stand up and say, enough, enough, we're not doing this anymore. We're not doing this anymore. Every generation behind me has, has followed after these idol gods, tried to make the pagans happy, and then we end up getting destroyed. Somebody has to stand up. Unfortunately, that's not happening. All right, listen, uh, don't take me wrong. Sin is inevitable in every human's life. I don't want you to think that. It's inevitable. But because sin is inevitable, confession and repentance are always available. That's really important that you understand that. God doesn't expect you to be sinless. He expects you to try. The Bible tells us in 1 John 1, 9, and they don't have that back there, but, you know, if, uh, if any man will confess his sin, he is faithful and righteous to cleanse him from all unrighteousness. God says, yeah, I know you're going to sin, and through Jesus, I'm going to make a way for you to immediately make that right with me because I know what happens if you don't. And Israel is the perfect example of what happens if you don't. Okay, so that's all the time I'm giving those kings. All right, so let's move on. This is Elisha. This is toward the end of Elisha's life. Okay, so we're coming up on his last day. 2 Kings 13.10. It says, In the 37th year of Joash, king of Judah, Jehoash, the son of Jehoaz, which these names crack me up, because uh, became king over Israel and Samaria, and he reigned 16 years. He did evil in the sight of the Lord. <gasps> What? A king from Israel doing evil? Did I read that wrong? Okay. He did evil in the sight of the Lord. He did not turn away from all the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, uh, with which he made Israel sin, but walked in them. Okay. Now, Joash was another one of those kings. Now, he wasn't as bad as some, but he was bad. He wasn't fully committed to God. He did believe, and I'll explain that here in a minute, but not fully. He wasn't fully committed to the one true God. He believed in Yahweh, and he believed that Yahweh was powerful, that he was a God, a God. He believed that he could do miraculous and powerful things. I mean, he believed in that. He believed in Yahweh, but, and he believed that, that Elisha, and he respected Elisha. He believed Elisha was a, was a powerful man of God, and he respected him for that. He got to see him do a lot of things, but he still believed and followed some of the religions from the, you know, the pagan religions that had been passed down from the previous kings, like from, from uh, Jeroboam and Nebat. Okay, so he was, he was kind of, it's hard to explain. If I had to, if, there are Christians in my mind who are a lot like Joash, and I call them convenient Christians. Okay, convenient Christians. And, and what that means is, is a convenient Christian is, is only committed when it's convenient to be committed. They'll give God everything when it's convenient to do so, right? And, and for instance, when they're in a spiritual crowd, they're spiritual. When they're here on Sundays, you know, when they come, when they're here on Sundays, they are, they're committed to it. But when they're with their less spiritual friends or people who don't believe at all, they assimilate and become just like them. They pretty much look like whoever they're with and sound like whoever they're with. That's what a convenient Christian, and that's what Joash was. To the pagans, he, he worshipped paganism, and to, the, to, you know, to those who followed Yahweh, he worshipped that. In my mind, convenient Christians and Joash are like noodles. They taste like what you put them with. You know what I mean? Ramen noodles have proved that. Am I right? i got to ask, how many people like ramen noodles? That's it? How many people got to a point in their life when that's all they had to eat? I noticed you didn't raise your hand for liking ramen noodles, so I get it. But noodles taste like whatever you put them with. Ramen's made a living on that, you know. Hey, look, we can do 20 different things. Look, noodles, and now they're pork noodles. Chicken, and now they're chicken noodles. 
That's what Joe Ash and convenient Christians are like. Well, whoever they're with, that's who they taste like. You know, that's it. That they just kind of assimilate with whatever crowd they're with. And this is definitely who he was. And here's the thing. It's sad, but convenient Christians seldom accomplish anything. Anything at all for God. Because God can't use somebody who's half in and half out. He just can't use somebody that's, that's partially committed. They just rarely succeed. And the reason is they're usually too busy to read and pray. They're too busy to worship. They're too busy to get involved and serve and give and do all the things that grow you closer to God. They're just, they're just you know, they're too busy for that. They, they'll do that stuff when it's convenient. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you guys inside my dark mind for a second. Do you want to take a journey with me? Okay, everybody's going, no, we don't. Here's the deal. It's kind of funny when you see this, but, you know, you see these, these believers who who are half in and half out, and, and they, they can't make a, a solid decision if they want to they serve, they don't want to serve. Here's one of my pet peeves, okay? I've had people literally come up to me and say, I love early service. And I'm like, oh, well, we're glad we can. Was that way I get it over with? I'm like, you make it sound like a booster shot or something. You know, like you're getting tested for COVID. I got it over with. I went to early service. I'm clean. You know what I mean? Came back negative. But... That's frustrating, and I, I want so bad to look at them and go, convenient Christian, but I don't. i got to stop saying that. But, or, or they say things like, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I wanted to go to church, but I got up, I opened the door, it's kind of chilly. So I thought, you know, God doesn't want me to get a cold. You know what I mean? That, that's convenient Christianity, and I see a lot of that, and that's what I think of when I look at, at Joash. That, that's just who he was. He was not completely committed, but despite his lack of commitment, one thing you have to say, Joash did appreciate Elijah, Elisha and all that Elisha had done. He knew that, that through Elisha's faith and guidance and his courage that he had always represented the best interests of Israel and the best interests of God. He respected that. No doubt he had witnessed him do a lot of things. So he felt compelled when he heard that Elisha was toward the end of his days to go and visit him. Okay, So he was right on his deathbed when he comes to see him. So 2 Kings 13, 14. It says, when Elisha became sick with the illness of which was, uh, he was to die, Joash the king of Israel came down to him and wept over him and said, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. Uh, verse 15, Elisha said to him, Take a bow and arrows. So he took a bow and arrows. <laughs> Does that seem random? When I read it, I just crack up. Because he's like, No, you're not dying. Please don't die. Grab your bow. What? Grab your bow, stupid. You know what I mean? This is, I just think this is random. All right, he said to him, take a bow and arrows. So he took the, a bow and arrows. Then he said to the king of Israel, put your hand on the bow. And he put his hand on it. And then Elisha laid his hands on the king's hands. Remember that. Verse 17. He said, open the window toward the east. And he opened it. Then Elisha said, shoot. And he shot. And he said, the Lord's arrow of victory, even the arrow of victory over Aram, for you will defeat the Arameans at Aphek until you have destroyed them. So one thing you can see is by the words Joash was speaking to Elisha, you can see that he did greatly respect him. And basically what he was doing, you know, that all oh, the horses and chariots, he's basically, it was a way of saying you're valuable to us, you make us stronger. I, basically he's saying, I don't know what I'm going to do without you. I don't know what we're going to do without your guidance. That's basically what he's saying. He's in this mourning state. He's getting tears in his eyes. He's saying, I just, I don't want you to go. You know, I mean, he recognizes all the power that Elisha had brought to Israel and the, and the wisdom that he had brought to Israel. And I'm convinced he saw Elisha perform a lot of miracles. And so he's heartbroken and he's, you know, he's, he's pouring his heart out to him. And Elisha says, pick up a bow. Right? Pick up a bow. And it's kind of funny the reason he does that. Right? Because he, he's going to serve God right down to his last breath. I, he didn't have time to hear your mourning. He didn't have time to hear, oh, you've, I know you feel bad. He, I don't want to hear any of that. He said, as long as I'm here, I'm going to be serving God. I have directions for you. I want you to listen carefully, right? Even in Elisha's death, he was serious about serving God, right? And, you know, there's an old saying that says, you know, it, it's kind of strange, but, it, but it's true. It says, you know, what you live for is evident when you die. And that is so true. What you live for is evident when you die, because that's how people will remember you, right? If there were a eulogy being written for Elisha, it would be, he was all about God. His whole life was to bring the light of God into this world and to try to keep Israel out of trouble. That was his whole life. Because here's what a eulogy is. Now, sometimes, how many people know what a eulogy is? You notice sometimes they spice them up? Because, you know, I don't even like to read them at funerals, because 
I'm telling you everything you already know in that eulogy. But sometimes you'll read them and you're like, who is this? Because it ain't him. You know what I mean? <laughs> he is a loving father and husband. I'm like, lift that lid. Who is in that casket? <laughs> Are you sure? Because that doesn't describe. Sometimes they, they spice them up a little bit. But a eulogy, you know, in its most honest form is simply, you know, a recounting of the facts taken from the life you lived. That's what the eulogy is. So if you looked at the facts in Elijah's life, all the way up to his death, he was all about serving God. All about serving God. That's all that really mattered to him. And sometimes I think we should all stop and ask ourselves, what eulogy is my life writing right now? If I were to die right now, what would my life's eulogy be? How did my life represent what they're saying? You know what I mean? And that's something we need to talk about. To be honest with you, I don't, I'm, when I think about that, I'm like, yeah, I better not die. Because there's a lot of things about my life that need to get better. You know what I mean? But sometimes I think we need to think about that. We need to stop and say, what impact is my life making on this world? Because I'm left here to make an impact for Christ. If I'm not, I'm failing. So what would my eulogy say? If someone looked at my life, would they see God as, a, as, as important to me like we see here with Elisha? Right? So anyway, Elisha serving right up to the very end. He says, okay, yeah, yeah, you're sad. I'm dying. Shut up for a minute. He's like, grab your bow. And he grabs the bow. And then Elisha grabs his hand while his hand is on the bow. This is something that Joash should have picked up on. He was basically saying what's about to happen is coming from God because your hand's on the bow, my hand's on the bow, and I'm the servant of God. So what you're about to do with this bow is blessed, is about what he was saying. right? And then he says, I want you to open an east-facing window. And he opens the window. And he says, I want you to shoot an arrow. And he shoots an arrow out the window toward the east. Right now, in those days, in those days, a spear, if you threw a spear into the ground or shot a, an arrow into the ground toward the direction of your enemy, it was a proclamation of war. It was a declaration of war. You're saying, listen, it's time to go to war. So Elisha was saying, I want you to go to war with Aram. And the arrow that you fired, his member, his hand was on, his, on the hand of Joash when he picked up the bow. The arrow you fired represents that God is going to give you the victory. I touched your hand, meaning I'm, I'm showing you God is with what you're about to do, and I'm asking you to declare war, and God is with you. Fire that arrow. And he fires that arrow, right? And then he's trying to establish something with him. He's trying to establish the link between arrows and God-given victory. That's what he's trying to get through to him. Look at verse 17 again. He said, open the window toward the east, and he opened it. Then Elisha said, shoot, and he shot. Then he said, the Lord's arrow of victory, even the arrow of victory over Aram. For you will defeat the Arameans at Apec uh, until you have destroyed them. So you see, he's trying to draw the link between these arrows represent the promise God has made you to win. Right? I, that's going to be important. Trust me. Right? Now, these are all very symbolic, but he should have picked up on it. But what he does next kind of shows that he still isn't completely committed. All right? 2 Kings 13, 18. It says, then he said, take the arrows. Now, what did he say here? Take the what? Take the arrows. Did he give a number of arrows? So you would assume when he says take the arrows, it means take the arrows, like all the arrows that are there, correct? Just thought I'd throw that out there. All right. He said, take the arrows, and he took them. And he said to the king of Israel, strike the ground, and he struck it three times and stopped. Okay, here's an issue. When it says strike the ground, in, in the Hebrew, it doesn't literally mean take the arrows and smack them into the ground. It means fire your arrows into the ground. He's saying take all these arrows and take your bow and fire each one of these arrows into your ground. Fire all the arrows into the ground. It said three times and stop. Verse 19. So the man of God was angry with him and said, You should have struck five or six times. Then you would have struck Aram until uh, you would have destroyed it. But now you shall strike Aram only three times. So Elisha, when he tells him to shoot these arrows, he said, Take the arrows and shoot them. It was symbolizing something powerful. He was saying, just like God gives you the victory through that arrow that you fired first, empty your arrows out, fire them all, because you're going to rain down victories on Aram until you destroy them. The arrow of God's victory is going to fly into their camp, and you, by shooting every arrow, you're saying you're going to send them to a complete destruction. He should have seen that. He didn't say shoot three arrows. He didn't say wing a couple arrows. He said shoot all the arrows, and it made him mad when he only fired three arrows. See, he was trying to inspire him to understand that God was going to win these battles for him. That all he had to do was trust God and give all he had, and God was going to win these battles for him. He wanted him to be impassioned by that promise. I mean, think about it. Elisha just said, fire those arrows, and God is going to give you your worst enemy. 
and he's half-hearted. He goes, he shoots three arrows in the ground, <laughs> and he stops. And Elisha's legitimately ticked. He's legitimately ticked. He's like, what are you doing? I shot some arrows in the ground. He said, I should, said, shoot the arrows. Shoot them all into the ground. Have you ever seen when your kids are only half committed to what you're telling them? Anybody ever see that? You're giving them directions. They're going, yeah, 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 yeah. And then they do it wrong. And you're like, why'd you do it that way? Well, you didn't say it. Yes, I did. You didn't listen. That's what I see. I see him. He's going, fire the arrows. You know, I got things to do. I got a tanning bed appointment. You know, he's firing these arrows into the ground. And he stops. And Elijah's like, did I say stop? No, did I tell you three arrows? No, I said fire the arrows into the ground. Because remember, those arrows symbolize a declaration of war. I was telling you that you would win every battle. Fire those, those arrows, declare war until they're completely decimated. But now, since you were a punk about it, right? This is my translation. Since you were a punk about it and shown such a lack of passion, you know what? Three is a good number because that's how many times you'll win. And that's it. You'll win three times. You're not going to totally destroy them because you were a punk. You didn't do what you were told to do. All right? So I see that you don't have a real passion for God's promises. Right? Now, he was hoping this would impassion him. It just, it just didn't. See, what Elisha was trying to do was show ash. Was, show, was, show ash, was to show ash. You know, I'm not even going to. There's so many things I could say right now. I got to wind that back. But anyway, uh, he, was trying, he was trying to teach Joe has the power of being prepared. See, God was trying to prepare him. He was trying to say, listen, if you trust me, notice he said the arrow was victory from God. I will bring victory into your life. It takes a king that trusts God to have victory. It takes a king that's willing to do exactly what God asked to experience victory. This is what he was trying to teach him. He wanted him to understand that. But he just, he was half committed. He didn't, he didn't pick up on it. He was half committed. Now, God still wants to and has made a way for believers to prepare for battle. And I always hear people talking about how they're struggling with this and struggling with that. And if you ask them, how are you preparing to face those struggles? You'd be shocked with some of the responses I get. You'd be shocked because God has given us everything we need to know to be successful in the battles we face. And we do face battles every day. Every day we face battles. I've had people come up to me, one of the most popular questions I've been asked, because they say, you know, Pastor, I've been struggling with this sin. When will I not struggle with that? And I'm like, uh, when you go to heaven? And that's the honest answer. I am not going to lie to you and say, yeah, you'll, after you win one battle, you're done. The devil's afraid of you. You'll never have, a, that's a lie. You're going to have battles with temptation your entire life. If you'd like to share your temptations, we make a, no, I'm just kidding. But everybody has those temptations you battle with. Don't you have that one temptation that you pray about and say, God, why? Why doesn't this go away? Because the enemy's found a great way to attack you, and that's his only job, is to attack you. So he's attacking you. It just cracks me up. He's going to keep coming after you, and if you're not prepared, you're going to lose. You have to be prepared. Now, there are people that act like you can be tougher than the, than the devil, and that's just not true. Now, I've told this story before, but I'm going to tell it again because I can there was this preacher I heard one time, no joke. He was preaching about how he took on the devil one-on-one, -on -one, mano y mano. And I'm like, I got to hear this. My wife's always saying, why do you listen to this stuff? It just makes you mad. I'm like, quiet. <laughs> Silence, woman. Notice she's not here. <laughs> Silence back in the kitchen. No, I'm just kidding. God, please don't let that go online. <laughs> no, but she's like, why do you listen to that? I'm like, shh. And he goes, I went to my hotel room after preaching at one of my crusades. He said the devil showed up in my hotel room. I was like, where'd you find him? In the mirror? But anyway, um, he said, I went to bed, and he said the devil came into my room. I'm like, did he take the, you know, the servant's elevator? How did he get up there without anybody seeing him? Oh, no, the devil just appeared in my room. That's what I was thinking to myself. So I'm like, okay. And he said, the devil comes in, and he starts making threats and trying to scare me, and he moved my bed across the room, and he was shaking it, and my covers and my pillows were falling off, and he took the couch and flipped it over in the hotel room, and he dumped all the, all the uh, dresser drawers out that I'd put my clothes in. He took all my clothes off the hanger. He was just trying to scare me. And people are like amen and like crazy, and I'm going, what is in the Kool-Aid? <laughs> you know? And then he says, but I wasn't scared. I stood up to him nose to nose, and I'm thinking, and it gets deeper. Put the boots on. 
And he says, and when he got done, he turned around and decided he couldn't defeat me, so he started to leave. And I said, hold it, devil. You get back in here and clean up your mess. <laughs> and I'm sitting here going, is, is there going to be a jester jump out? Is this a joke? And he said, the devil cleaned my room back up and put it back where it was because we got power over the enemy. <laughs> Can you see the devil fold this clothes going, boy, I wish you hadn't messed with him. That's a... <laughs> you know? The devil's running, you know, the, the Dyson sweeper going, I knew I shouldn't have done this. <laughs> I didn't throw that down. You pick up your own. Now, see, we have no power over him. He's tougher than us. I would never take him on because he would beat me like a four-year-old at Kmart. I know that. So here's the thing. I just realized you got to have God's preparation. you got to be prepared. Let God prepare you for each one of these battles, each one of these temptations. If you have any prayer of coming out victorious. And the Apostle Paul talked about this and to the Ephesians. And I'm not going to go in depth into these verses, but verse six, or chapter 6, verse 10 says, Finally, be strong in the Lord. Be strong what? In the Lord. Be strong in the Lord and in his strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. So how do you stand firm against the schemes of the devil? Put on the armor of God. You cover yourself in the protection and in the preparation God's provided. Verse 12, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against uh, the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of darkness, against spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. See, we're not, it's not as simple as going out and duking it out with somebody. and go, you don't, We're not fighting flesh and blood here. We are fighting a world system that is totally influenced by the enemy, and it is getting more powerful every day. That's our enemy. We don't, it doesn't have a, a specific form. It takes on many forms. Right? I mean, believers have to prepare for battle, and they get that preparation from God. If you look, and let's move on to verse 13, Ephesians 6, 13. It says, Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day, and having done everything, to stand firm. Stand firm there, having girded, having girded your loins with truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having, your, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In addition to all, taking up the shield of faith, with which you will be able to extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. See, this is how believers are supposed to go to battle. We get, I mean, absolutely saturated with God before we go to battle. We pray, we fast, we, we make sure that, that we're on the same page if we want to beat these, these temptations and these battles we go into. You know, I love how it says the shield of faith. That's the only thing I really have time to explain. But, you know, their shields were made of wood and they had leather on top of them. And so when an arrow would fire into them, it would stick in that leather and go out. It wouldn't stay on fire. And they attached together, the shields did at that time. So if there was a barrage of arrows flying, each person fighting in this battle side by side could attach their shields and hold it over their head as a canopy to protect them from the arrows. This goes to show you God makes a way for us to be protected if we're going into battle together, all of us prepared. You see what I mean? But if you notice, Paul's telling them, listen, if you want to be, have any success at all battling the enemy... You've got to be prepared, and you've got to let God be the one to prepare you. And I promise you, those people you see doing great things for God are those people who take great painstaking time to make sure they're prepared. Listen, another thing that I tell my girls that I coach, and they probably get sick of it, is, listen, I can coach everything but heart. You can't coach heart. And, you know, they, they get it by the end of the time they're playing with me, and here's why. I can't, I can teach you how to play this game. I can teach you how to do it at a high level, but if you don't apply it, it's not going to help you. I can show you the way to success, but you have to have the courage and you have to be bought in and be willing to put the time in to do the things you're being taught. If you do them, if you buy in, if you have the heart, you'll experience victory, right? And what Elisha was trying to do here was the equivalent of having your team practice and get ready. He was trying to prepare Joash's heart to realize that if you want victory in Israel, the battle has to be God's. The arrows have to be God's. Everything has to be God's. If you want victory here, he has to be the battle planner. He has to be the one that is behind everything you do, that plans everything you do. And he just wouldn't buy in. He just wouldn't buy in. And I'll tell you what, any, anybody that's ever coached knows when you have a team that doesn't buy in, you might as well quit. There's nothing you can do for that team other than run them to death, which is exactly what I would do. But anyway, 
That's just, you know, and believers who don't take the time to prepare and practice the skills they need for victory, just like in sports, if they don't practice the skills they need for victory and and saturate themselves with God, you're going to suffer loss. Just like a team that doesn't practice well, they lose. I always tell my girls, the one who practices the most, or the one who hits the most and feels the most, wins the most. It's the same thing. Listen, the one who prays and reads and saturates himself with God is the one that will have success because God will be the one guiding them. This is exactly what he was trying to teach Joash with his last words, but he just didn't. He just wouldn't buy in. Here's the big thing. Yes, there are tough temptations, but God has given you everything you need to be successful in the word of God. And a lot of times people say, I know, but when, it, when the occasion rises, I just can't stop myself. And I'm like, don't use the word can't, it's won't. Stop yourself. Listen to this, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what? What you are able. But with the temptation will provide a way of what? Escape also, so that you will be able to endure it. So you can escape, right? You can endure, right? You can bear the temptation. Here's the trick if you're letting God prepare you. Here's the problem. When that temptation comes, a lot of times we don't look for a way out because we've convinced ourselves it's okay. Our sin isn't that bad. We don't look for a door or a window. We don't look for it. People say, well, how come I can't stop doing this? Because you don't want to. I really do want to. Then give it to God so you have a chance. You don't have a chance without him. It's the same thing he was trying to teach him. Now, Moving on here, uh, 2 Kings 13, 20. It says, Elisha died. (laughs) I'll tell you why that's funny in a minute. Not that his death was funny, okay? But I want you to pay attention to the extraordinary way Elisha leads this world. Now, remember, he followed in the footsteps of Elijah, right? And he asked God to give him a double portion of everything that Elijah had. And he, God gave it to him, right? If you look, if you do the math, he did about twice the miracles. But Elijah went out in style. He didn't even die, man. I mean, chariots of fire, angels, I mean, heaven's, you know, cover band. It was, it was on. It was a big deal. Everybody knew that he was being taken up. And you would think that a guy who did twice as much would exit this world in a powerful and amazing fashion. And here we are, Elijah died and they buried him. And the end. But we'll come back to that. Uh, Now, the bands of the Moabites would invade the land in the spring of each year, or of the year. As they were burying a man, behold, they saw a marauding band. And they cast the man into the grave of Elisha. And when the man touched the bones of Elisha, he revived and stood up to his feet. Okay. So, Elisha's initial funeral boring, right? Died out, put in the tomb, right? So this is another funeral. This is a different funeral. Uh, It's in the springtime. It's when the Moabites would come down and raid. They were just raiding parties. They would run in, steal a bunch of stuff, kill a bunch of people, take their servants, get out. They were a marauding party, right? That's what they would do. People were terrified of them. So there's people there at a funeral getting ready to bury one of their friends, and they spot in a distance this Moabite group of raiders coming in, and they knew what would happen if they caught him. So because the person meant so much to him, they're like, sling him in that tomb, and let's get the heck out of here. They didn't even take time to bury him. They literally opened Elisha, they threw him in Elisha's tomb, and took off, because they didn't want to be there when the marauders got there. Now, I want you to shift gears. Imagine you're the dead guy. You probably died surrounded by your family and friends and loved ones peacefully. Now you open your eyes and you're in a dead man's tombs laying on his bones alive. Okay, that guy is underrated here because he had to be freaking out. Right, because the second he hits, they throw that body in there. The second that body hits Elisha's bones, it brings life to them. Which makes sense because Elisha's entire life was about bringing the light and life of God into Israel. That's what his entire life was about. So why shouldn't it be about that in his death? Right? Right? Verse 22, 
Now Haziel, king of Aram, had oppressed Israel all the days of Jehoaz, but the Lord was gracious uh, to them and had compassion on them and turned, the, and, and turned to them because of his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and would not destroy them or cast them from his presence. Now, when, when Haziel, king of Aram, died, Ben-Hadad, his son, became king in his place. Then Joash, the son of Jehoaz, took again from the hand of Ben-Hadad, the son of Haziel, the cities which he had taken uh, in war from the hand of Jehoaz, his father. Three times Joash defeated him and recovered the cities of Israel. That's going to come back and bite him later. Remember, how many times did he say he'd have victory there? Three. Three. So what do you think is going to happen from here on out? From here on out, he's going to wish he shot the rest of those dang arrows in the ground, isn't he? This is where he's going to hate that. Okay, so after Elisha dies, he did have this extraordinary exit after all. Yeah, his funeral wasn't much, but another funeral happens. They take off running. They throw a dead body in his tomb, and he comes back to life. Imagine that. I mean, throw a dead body in a tomb, and it comes out going, oh, I mean, screaming, looking at dead bones hanging off of him. Right? Talk about putting the fun back in funeral. There it is. Dead bodies coming up, taking off running, right? So he did get that, you know, that amazing exit, it just differently. I'm sure this passed, and a lot of people heard about this. But I'm, here's the thing. When we read through this story, there's a lot of funny stuff, and there's a lot of stuff that seems to make sense. But here's what it boils down to. This could have been a, a king that brought change. He could have been, because he at least was convinced that Yahweh was real. He was convinced that Elisha was important. If he could have just taken that extra step and been completely dedicated and allowed God to prepare him, this could have been the swing in the, history, in the history of Israel. This could have been the turning point. But he just refused to commit. He refused to let God be the one that prepared him. He had too many divided interests. And here's the thing. I, I honestly believe that as Christians, we are no longer putting the time into preparation to face the daily battles we should face like we used to at one time, like there used to be in the history of Christianity. I don't think we're there. I mean, it, it kind of shocks me when I ask people, how many people read and pray every day? I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands. But it was shocking how many people say, eh, I just don't really have time. And that is your preparation. You are not going to be accomplishing the will of God without reading his word. It's not going to happen. If you're not praying and you're not reading, I don't care how religious you are. I don't care how many times you go to church. If you're not praying and reading for yourself, you are not putting that armor on. And you will lose those battles. And those battles are coming, trust me, right? It's just, it's just the way it is. You ask believers, you know, are you, are you involved in anything at your church? Are you involved in anything? And do you have a personal ministry? Nah, you know, I just go listen to them preach and go home early so I don't waste my whole day, you know? And it's sad because now we enter this difficult time in our history. Would you all say we're in a difficult time? Yeah. And we're falling stinking apart. Whining posting weird stuff. Remember, my, remember when I did a devotion called Pray Before You Post? Yeah, y'all need to see that one again. All right? We're all angry and posting and, and, and talking and, and it, oh, it's terrible. The world's going to come to an end. It's going to be crushed and the country's going to fall into the sea and we're going to be eaten by whales. And I mean, we just, <laughs> we're losing it here. Here's the facts. God is in control. He's been in control since the creation of time. He'll be in control when his son splits the eastern sky. He'll be in control while his son reigns for a thousand years. He'll be in control when we enter New Jerusalem. He always has been in control. He always will be in control. We just weren't prepared to face this big of a battle because we didn't take time to get prepared. This is a temptation and a battle that's one of the biggest we've had as believers. And I don't think... If we were prepared, we would be fighting with each other and other people. You know, amidst a difficult time in the life of Joash, he comes. Elisha says, the victory is yours if you're willing to buy in and let God take control. That offer still stands. That's still the key to victory. It's still the key to victory. If you are tired of losing the battles you face, get better prepared. If you're tired... And a feeling like there's no hope, then get better prepared. Because I'll be real honest with you, 2020 is in my rear view. You know what? And here's what I got to say about all the terrible stuff that happened in 2020. God brought me through it. How about you? How about you? So instead of whining about it, how about we say, praise God, we just walked through the manure field. Maybe this next one will be flowers. 
right? We need to get prepared because we don't know what we're going to face this year. But if we want that victory, we've got to be sold out and fully prepared. I'm going to go ahead and close there. We'll pick up there next week. I'm going to ask you, would, to please bow your heads. If this is your first time, we always like to give an invitation. And I don't ask people to come up front or anything like that. I don't put pressure on you. I just want to pray for you. So if, while every head is bowed, if you're not sure where you stand and you'd like me to pray for you, just make eye contact with me. Put your head. Bless those people. I'm not going to point you out. Bless those people. I'm just going to pray for you because I know what that feels like. One thing I don't think Christians do a good enough job doing is letting you know that the difference between you and us is the grace of God. We don't deserve this. We never will. So if you're listening online or watching online, God knows your heart. I'll be praying for you too. Believers, I always pray for us. And the reason is, is during difficult times, there needs to be strong, committed Christians that are willing to be the lights in the darkness. And that's what I want us to be. Fully committed, fully prepared. Let's pray. God, I thank you so much for your love and your mercy. I just thank you for your kindness. It amazes me that you can love us the way you love us, even though we don't deserve it. We can never be good enough. But your love is so much stronger than our sin, and we're just thankful that you sent your son to die and pay our sin debt in full. It cost him a great deal, and it was at great lengths that he went to see that we get ensured that promise. But it's simple for us, and we're thankful for that. If there's anyone here who doesn't know you, whatever's holding them back, just move it out of their mind. Let them know that the hard work has been done by Jesus. Now they just need to believe that what he did was enough, and you've guaranteed them eternal life. If they make that decision, I pray they would contact us. And God, for those of us who are believers, I don't know how we lost our way, but we have. God, give us a passion and a desire and a yearning for your word. Let us find our peace and our comfort in your word and not on the news, not in the culture, just in your word. Let us take the promises you made and trust them and apply them to our lives so that we can have success in these battles. God, we know you want us to win. Give us a passion to want to win. Let us get prepared, Lord. We just pray you'd go with us as we leave here. Keep us safe. And if you don't return to take us home before we meet again, we just pray you'd give us the time to come together and give you all the praise, honor, and glory. You're so worthy of it, at least one more time. We just thank you, and we ask these things in Jesus' name.